Members will be aware that social distancing is no longer in operation. I'd like to remind members that Mr Speaker has encouraged us all to wear masks and also remind honourable members that there have been some changes to normal practice in order to support the hybrid arrangements which we have today. I remind uh, colleagues participating physically and virtually that they must arrive for the start of the debate and I think that is the case today and members are expected to remain for the entire, the entire debate please. I must also remind members participating virtually that they must leave their camera on for the duration of the debate and that they will be visible at all times both to each other and to us here in the Boothroyd room. If members attending virtually have any technical problems, they should email the Westminster Hall Clerks email address, which is Westminster Hall Clerks at Parliament.uk. Uh, and members also uh, attending physically, if they could still clean their places uh, when they uh, leave and uh, ensure that other honourable members can come into their place with a clean place. So we move on now to Tonya. Antony Artsy to move the motion. That this House has considered e petition 317336 relating to cervical screening. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship for this really important debate. And I apologise for not being able to be in person today, but thank the, the House for the hybrid proceedings following being pinged last week. But I would like to begin by putting on record my huge thanks to Caitlin, who is Fiona's sister, speaking to me last week about Fiona's case and the way it has affected her whole family. I would also like to thank Fiona's friends, Melissa MacDonald and Neve Foley, who started this petition, and to all those who have signed it, leading to this debate being held today. As a woman, we all sort of dread getting the call up for our smear test. Uh, it's not painful for most, but it is uncomfortable and it's awkward. What do you even chat about when the nurse is having a little look? But what should it be? Uh, you know, why should it be like this? We've all been there. The nurse has seen it all before. It's just not spoken about. So we feel a sense of shame about it. And it's time we stopped being so coy about it because it may well persuade more women to go for their screening and ultimately save lives. Cervical cancer is one of the most common cancers in women under 35. 99.7% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV. In recent years, testing for HPV has meant that it is easier to identify who is at greater risk from cervical cancer at the earliest stage. Pre-COVID, England had an attendance rate of nearly 72%. That's over one in four women not going for screening when invited. The wonderful charity Jaws Trust have a number of ideas to increase the uptake of smear tests and I will suggest that the Minister meets them to discuss the ways of increasing the number of women getting tested. I know she does take a keen interest in women's health. And I was really moved when I spoke to Caitlin because I got a real sense of how difficult it must be to lose a sister, especially at such a young age. Fiona was only 30 when she died married to Matthew and a mother of two young children. Ivy was only four years old and Harry had just turned two. And as Caitlin said, Fiona used all of her strength to stick around for Harry's second birthday. Fiona was called for her first smear test in 2015, but was pregnant with Ivy, so was told not to go. But she was then called again. She was pregnant with Harry, but there was no follow up to the first appointment. Fiona never received a reminder to go to her smear in the interim period. Now, this isn't about someone missing appointments when they were called. Fiona went to every appointment she was meant to go to. Fiona's cancer was finally diagnosed after a routine smear test in 2018. She didn't have any symptoms, but there seemed to be a lot of holdups and delays to diagnosing Fiona's cancer. Caitlin mentioned that that could perhaps be as a result of Fiona and Matthew's moving from England to Scotland that she got her first invitation. And that raises questions about the communications between the devolved administrations and what procedures are in place to make sure that communication between different trusts and devolved countries is clear. A hysterectomy was performed and Fiona then went through chemotherapy and radiotherapy as a belt and braces approach to dealing with the cancer. 
But after this, Fiona had a number of visits to a &E, including one where the doctor later admitted that she knew the, the problem was actually cancer and not a hernia, but didn't say anything as Fiona was seeing a specialist soon after. Now, most of us are not medical experts. We rely on doctors to tell us the truth because we don't know what is going on. And that vulnerability is really exposed when we hear stories like this. I know it is extremely rare to hear stories like Fiona's and the vast majority of our doctors, nurses and all of the health service staff do really care, but it's shocking nonetheless. Before COVID hit, cancer services were already struggling due to severe staff shortages. And despite the incredible efforts by staff, a backlog has built up, relying on current staff who again, haven't had a pay raise, to, to clear the backlog on top of regular services will only lead to burnout and it just isn't sustainable. Research from Macmillan back in 2017 showed that 2,500 2, specialist cancer nurses were needed to maintain cancer services. By 2030, we would need 3,700 new nurses, an increase of 124% on the levels in 2017. These figures are going to have hugely been impacted also by the pandemic. The government have come forward with their own cancer workforce strategy, which is inadequate. And I would implore the minister to reconsider the plans they have and come up with something that will really help those who are living with cancer. All this happened to Fiona before the pandemic hit last year. And we have heard countless times about the delays in diagnosis and treatment the last 60 months has caused. Approximately 1.5 million smear tests take place every year and with the pressure on the NHS since March 2020 that could mean one and a half million women are missing out on a vital tool in diagnosing cervical cancer. We know that the rates of COVID infection are on the up. Hospitalizations for COVID are rising and some NHS trusts across the UK are already cancelling operations as they are at capacity. So the recklessness of so-called Freedom Day in England and removing all of the measures that have been put in place to keep us safe are quite unbelievable. Putting the immunosuppressed, such as those going through cancer treatment, is quite frankly downright dangerous. And I'm glad that the devolved nations have taken a more cautious approach. But what will this extra pressure on the health service mean? Another delay in getting a smear test? And what will this do to the outcomes for so many young women? What will the government be doing to make sure that those women who miss out are not left behind and stop a knock-on effect on testing? So, this, you know, we are looking at new ways forward and Fiona's case has indeed highlighted some gaps that were there before the pandemic started and things have only deteriorated since COVID hit. But we must work together to make sure that the cancer services are the best they possibly can be and that our cancer workforce is protected and given all the tools that they need to continue to save lives. When Fiona got really ill, her daughter Ivy used to ask why mummy had to spend so much time in bed. To stop another family having to answer those questions, I'd like the minister to answer some of the questions that Fiona's family and friends have and all of those that have lost someone to cervical cancer need to have answers to. What are the procedures put in place to make sure that women like Fiona don't fall through the cracks? How does that work across the devolved nations? What is the backlog currently on screening? And what plans to increase the cancer workforce are currently in place? Caitlin finished our meeting by saying that any change that could come from this debate is that if one life is saved, and if one family doesn't have to go through what her family have been through, it would be worth it. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, the question is that this House has con considered a petition 317336 relating to cervical screening. Before I call uh, John Lamont, if colleagues do want to remove jackets, the attendance has been fantastic in helping the air conditioning. It's still very warm if people want to remove jackets, feel free. John Lamont. Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's a pleasure to serve with you um, in the chair, Mr Pritchard. I'm pleased to be able to um, speak in today's important uh, debate, which, is, which, which has attracted so much support um, from my constituents in the Scottish Borders. With almost 3,000 
of the signatures coming from those in Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk, the highest number across the United Kingdom. This can be explained because the petition was launched by Borderer Andrew Mathewson, who lives in my constituency in Kelso. As we have heard, Andrew tragically lost his wife Fiona, mother of Ivy and Harry, who died after battling cervical cancer for, for 17 months, aged just 30. Now, I have met Andrew and I admire the way that he has tirelessly campaigned for cervical cancer screening, both in memory of Fiona and dedicating his work to ensure that other families do not go through what they had to deal with. Fiona's story is certainly close to the hearts of, of many people in the Scottish borders who, who know the Matthewsons, and indeed many far beyond across the country, with over 146,000 signatures recorded in total for this petition. Now, clearly, um, the NHS and this policy area is devolved to the Scottish Parliament, so my comments are going to have a distinctive um, Scottish slant. Now, around uh, 850 women die from cervical cancer each year in the UK. Sadly, that's more than two women every day. But cervical cancer is one of the most preventable cancers, and there are two key reasons for this. First, cervical screening tests are able to check for abnormal changes in sample cells from the cervix. Cervical screening is not a test for cancer, but early detection allows action to be taken to prevent cervical cancer from developing. Second, the HPV jab is an offer to every child between 12 and 14 in Scotland. For girls, it is designed to protect against types of HPV that cause around 70% of all cases of cervical cancer in Scotland. In most people, HPV doesn't cause harm and the infection clears on its own. But in some cases, HPV infection can lead to cell changes that progresses into cervical cancer. Taken together, cervical screening and the HPV vaccine mean that cervical cancer can be avoided. Now, Cancer Research UK have stated that cervical screening is the best protection against cervical cancer. Yet in Scotland, this is offered far less frequently than the rest of the United Kingdom. In England, Wales and Northern Ireland, women between 25 and 49 are screened every three years. But women in Scotland face a five-year wait before each screening. Over the past year, some women were notified that their waiting time of five years would be extended as NHS Scotland rightly diverted time and resources to tackling COVID-19. However, I'm pleased that the resumption of cancer services, including can can cancer services, including cervical screening, are now beginning to be treated as a priority by NHS Scotland. Alarmingly, Mr. Pritchard, this transparency from NHS Scotland was not mirrored by the Scottish Government, who failed to reveal that a number of women had developed cervical cancer after being wrongly excluded from the screening programme following a hysterectomy. One of these women tragically died. Now, the SNP government were made aware of these errors to, uh, back in, in the December audit, but waited until the last day before the Scottish Parliament's summer recess before revealing the scale of the problem to the Scottish Parliament. Now, this debate is not about party political point scoring, but it would be wrong of me not to highlight the concerns of anxious women, their families and the wider public who were left in the dark by the Scottish ministers. Ministers who prioritised their political campaign and attempted to avoid scrutiny. These serious errors have affected hundreds of women, with more cases potentially still to be identified. Mr Pritchard, the crux of this debate on cervical screening is about the opportunity to reduce the number of women who, are, who tragically die from cervical cancer. And in my closing remarks, I would like to address some ways in which we can reduce the, this number of preventable deaths. Evidence shows that the women most likely not to attend a cervical screening appointment are, are between the ages of 25 and 34. Yet the evidence also indicates that cervical cancer is the most common cancer in women of this age group. Awareness needs to be raised among women. There is a real incentive to ensure resources are dedicated to this cause and cervical cancer can be prevented. Now, one way that has been trialled in London has involved GPs sending text messages about cervical screening appointments instead of relying on sending letters through the post. Stigma also needs to be addressed, personal barriers such as lack of knowledge of the purpose and benefits of the test, as well as fear and anxiety about the procedure itself, can also play a role in women not attending their appointments. 
Finally, the Scottish Government should listen to the worries of some Scottish women who say that they are concerned that they would develop cervical cancer within the five years and just wouldn't know about it. Now, I want to end again by paying tribute to, to Andrew Matthewson and, and his family and friends who have been at the forefront of this um, petition and have ensured that we are debating this important issue today. Andrew continues to selflessly battle on behalf of women he, does not, he doesn't even know so that fewer families will have to lose a wife, mother, sister or daughter to this cancer. Thank you. Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a pleasure to serve under your chairship today. I am also incredibly grateful to be called to speak in this debate on a topic that colleagues may know is extremely close to my heart. It is also a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member and hear of Fiona's story, which is tragically so similar to so many other women's stories across the country. And my thoughts and condolences are with the whole Matheson family. As elected representatives, we have the great fortune of being able to speak up on a huge range of issues that matter the most to the people living in our local communities. It is a fantastic privilege and one that is not lost at all on me. But still, there are certain debates that speak to us as people, not just politicians. And when it comes to cervical screenings, I will always be a vocal and loud champion and I am delighted that we are taking the time to speak on this important issue today. We know that cervical screenings are the best way to protect against cervical cancer. The numbers speak for themselves. Indeed, cervical screenings can prevent more than 7 in 10 diagnoses. Those who know me well will know that I speak about cervical screenings whenever and wherever I possibly can, mostly because a delayed cervical screening changed my life almost overnight. Like many others, I put off having my first cervical screening age 25 for all the usual reasons. I was too busy, I didn't have the symptoms, and simply I had other priorities. After many conversations with friends, most of whom gave me a good telling off, when I shamefully revealed that I, my own screening had been delayed, I booked my appointment and thought nothing more of it. While most of us will all agree that cervical screening probably isn't up there with our top 10 favourite things to do on a morning, the test itself is relatively quick and simple. But as many of us will know, the wait for the results, that NHS letter arriving on your doorstep can feel genuinely endless, and in my opinion it is the hardest part about being tested. Fast forward to a few months after the screening, and I was sat in my local hospital undergoing a colposcopy after my initial test results came back abnormal and further examinations were required. I was genuinely terrified. Everyone had told me that a routine screening was nothing to be concerned about, that it would just be five minutes of awkward conversation with the nurse at my local GP practice, job done for the next three years in Wales, right? Well, sadly, that wasn't the case for me. I was told that I had abnormal CIN3 cells, which, if left undetected and untreated over a number of years, could develop into cervical cancer. You always think it won't happen to you, but there I was at the age of 25, diagnosed with CIN3 on a large area of my cervix. The next few weeks were a complete blur, I became obsessed with Googling everything I could about abnormal cells, potential treatment and cervical cancer. I became a prolific poster and reader of the forums on the excellent Joe's Trust Cervical Cancer Forum. And I found comfort in talking to others who had gone through or were going through exactly the same thing. Thankfully, the staff at my local hospital were incredible and almost immediately I underwent less treatment to burn off the abnormal cells on my cervix. I went to this appointment alone. It was one of the most surreal moments of my life and one that I try as I might, I know I will never forget. After the doctor had finished, which felt like an eternity at the time, she didn't look happy. More treatment was needed, she said. She told me that on close inspection, the abnormal cells in my cervix were embedded deeper and looked more challenging than initially expected. I will never forget those words. The next stage for me was a cold knife biopsy. Thankfully, this minor operation went smoothly and a few weeks later, I got the call that I desperately hoped for. The clinicians were confident that all the abnormal cells were removed. The damage was quite severe, and if I had put off that initial cervical screening test any later, the situation would have been so very different. The extent of the treatment meant that I was now without the majority of my cervix. Having this treatment, of course, comes with risks, such as slightly increased chance of giving birth prematurely, but at this point, I didn't really care. I just wanted the nightmare to be over with. I was without the majority of my cervix, but my life was saved. Sadly for many, as we have heard tragically in Fiona's case, this isn't the case. And I count my lucky stars that my friends gave me the push I needed to book my cervical screening when they did. After receiving treatment, I attended screenings every six months to ensure the abnormal cells didn't return. And even now, years down the line, my screenings are more common than most and I go on an annual basis. It would be wrong of me to pretend that I have not been impacted by the ordeal I went through. The physical scars might be internal, but the mental effects are some that I think I will always grapple with. And even years on, I still get that nervous feeling in my stomach before I go to my screening. 
But we have all seen the numbers. My very good friend, the Honourable Member for the Gawa, has touched on these in her opening remarks, and we can all recognise the devastation that cancer in its myriad of forms can have on those suffering, as well as on the close friends and family. It goes without saying that, of course, we should be doing everything we can to protect those who may be particularly at risk of developing cervical cancer, and regular cervical screenings are absolutely key if more lives are to be saved. And while I am pleased to say that there has been progress and specific incentives to encourage more people to attend their screenings, cell changes like mine, along with HPV, are often all falling through the gaps. HPV diagnosis in particular is still associated with high levels of fear, confusion, stigma and lack of understanding, despite it being an incredibly common virus. Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust recently surveyed its community of users who have HPV and found that one in two people said that they knew nothing about HPV prior to receiving a diagnosis. And interestingly, people with recurrent or persistent HPV report feeling let down by their bodies, anxious about the ongoing and uncertain nature of the condition, and often they feel like there is no support or information for them either. There is clearly a need for increased education from when the vaccine is first given, greater awareness of how common it is and how it affects the body, and greater information and support for those affected. And the same goes for cell changes like mine. Around 220,000 women will be told that they have cell changes each year and many will be treated to prevent the potential development of cervical cancer. There are opportunities to improve the care that is offered. We know treatment for cell changes is highly effective at preventing the development of cervical cancer, the impact of which can be truly devastating. But more must be done to ensure those women diagnosed with cell changes are properly supported before, during and after treatment. Research from Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust found that 20% of women said that the possible impacts and side effects of treatment were not explained to them beforehand. And even more shockingly, 60% were not told about the different types of treatment that was available to them. It is clear that while progress has thankfully been made in terms of the dialogue around cervical screenings, we still have a long way to go to change the situation more broadly. To conclude, Mr Chair, I am hopeful that today's debate will send a reminder to those who, like me, are putting off their own cervical screenings. But I also hope that by touching on issues, including HPV and cell changes, that people can learn about the broader benefits of screening too. And while health is of course devolved to the fantastic Welsh Labour Government, I truly believe that this is an issue that crosses the political divide. Indeed, I warmly look forward to hearing the Minister from the Minister about the work that she is doing, including across government departments and across the devolved nations, to encourage better understanding of the widespread benefits of cervical screening. Diolch. Margaret Ferry. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to serve uh, under your chairmanship, Mr Pritchard, and an honour to speak in this important debate today, and it's an absolute pleasure to follow the Honourable Member uh, and hear her personal story, and we're all glad, I'm sure, to see her here today. The petition we're debating today is a proposal to introduce yearly uh, cervical screenings for all women. The campaign titled Fiona's Laws, we've heard, was launched after the untimely death of 30-year-old mum Fiona from Kelso in the Scottish borders. Cervical screening is unequivocally the, bre the best protection method from cervical cancer, and I think I speak for all of us in this debate when I say that I hope to see greater uptake of screening. Prior to the pandemic, one in four women across the UK unfortunately did not accept their invitation for screening. This is higher in certain areas such as London and Glasgow, among women under 30 years of age and groups who face additional systemic barriers to their attendance. For example, this disproportionately affects LGBTQ people, with 40% of lesbian and bisexual women in the UK having been told they do not require cervical screening. Experience of trauma or violence can also deter women from attending, with 72% of women who have experienced sexual violence delaying or cancelling their appointments. With regards to the aim of the petition, most clinicians would largely disagree with the proposal to make cervical screening annual. The UK National Screening Committee sets the eligibility criteria for screening programmes and makes recommendations about changes in order to maximise the benefits and minimise harm. Cervical screening starts at the age of 25, not 18, as HPV is very rare in younger women with less than four cases per 100,000 due to the high uptake of the HPV vaccine. Around 90% of HPV infections are cleared naturally by the body in two years and many cases of cell changes return to normal without the need for treatment. 
Research generally suggests that lower screening age does not substantially reduce cases and can in fact lead to overtreatment, which can have serious implications on physical and mental health, including the ability to carry a child to term. A more viable option for increasing uptake of cervical screening would be to roll out widespread HPV self-sampling, which would allow women to enjoy the comfort and convenience of performing the test in their own homes. Research by Joe's Trust suggests this would greatly increase uptake, with 47% of women who rarely or never book a test preferring self-sampling to clinician-led screening. Only 9% preferred clinician-led screening, 50% of women who are overdue for an appointment, and 34% of women from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds also preferred self-sampling. 63% of those living with a physical disability have noted that their disability made it impossible for them to attend screening. Making self-sampling possible would put the screening process into women's own hands. For this to be recommended by the UK National Screening Committee, far more research into this procedure is required. At the moment, only a few pilot schemes are being run, one in Scotland in Dumfries and Galloway and another in London. It is essential that progress on these vital studies continues. It would be helpful to know if the UK Government has plans to increase support for such schemes and accelerate study into the viability of HPV self-sampling nationwide, as well as an estimate of when the necessary research will be collected by NHS England. While annual cervical screening may not be realistically viable or desirable, there are concrete steps we can take to ensure access is widened, risk is adequately assessed and appointments are not missed. I hope the Department of Health and Social Care will take some of these considerations on, especially with regard to advancing the research into and the rollout of home HPV self-sampling. Thank you. Thank you. Virtual to Taiwo Awatemi. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and it's a pleasure to, f to follow after the member for Rotherglen and Hamilton West, who spoke with great passion about this really crucial issue. Cervical cancer is something that all women fear. It is not just a deadly disease, but one like breast cancer, the stripes at the heart of how we view ourselves as women. The petition that we're all discussing today Fiona's Law received over 146,000 signatures, and many of whom are my constituents in Coventry. That figure represents a groundwell of people who are concerned that not enough is being done to ensure detection of cervical cancer for women in the UK. And we cannot ignore them. To detect cervical cancer early, we have developed highly accurate screening tests which enable women to know whether they have precancerous cells and if so, receive the proper treatment. In fact, women will be tested for HPV before they get cervical screening because 99.7% of all cervical cancers are caused by HPV. Simply put, thanks to our researchers and thanks to all the medical professions across our NHS, tests for cervical cancer are more accurate than ever before. There has, however, been much debate in this country concerning how early and how frequently women should be screened for cervical cancer. But women are only able to have their cancer detected if the screenings are successfully performed. Research on how often women are accessing their existing appointment should give us a real cause for concern. Now, we all know that the pandemic has, has had devastating effects effects on women's ability to access life-saving cervical cancer screening. Joe Cervical Cancer Trust estimated around 600,000 tests failed to go ahead in the UK in the months of April and May in 2020. And figures show that cancer screening for women in the age of about 25 to 64 um, age group, which is the most vulnerable age group, decreased by nearly 7% from the previous year. These figures are completely unacceptable and they show the recent physical barriers to screening has a strong negative impact on women's access to preventative services. But they also show 
that there was an equally strong mental impact as well. Now, unfortunately, despite this life-saving smear test remains a real source of great anxiety to many. Earlier this year, it emerged that around one in four women eligible for smear test do not take up the invitation. New research has found that amongst those who do not go in for their cervical cancer screening, 75% are scared at the thought of going, and 81% are embarrassed to get it. Now, the government must do more to create public awareness about the test, to normalise it so that women do not feel embarrassed at seeking this vital service, and to bust other myths which induce anxiety about this test. Perhaps most worrying, Joe Cervical Cancer Trust has published a study which revealed that women from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds are twice as likely to be strongly worried about contracting a virus at a cervical cancer screening than their white counterpart, and a third more likely to feel unsafe visiting a doctor surgery than white women. It is vital that the government looks more closely into the cultural and mental barriers preventing Black, Asian and minority ethnic women in much higher proportions from accessing these life-saving screening. They must dedicate more resources to learning why women, especially those from minority backgrounds, are not taking up their testing appointments. I see this as crucial to achieving a reproductive health programme, which is not only thriving, but equal as well. So I look forward to hearing from the Minister on the work that she is doing on this. Thank you. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today, as I often have in this hall, uh, and, and I look forward very much to the Minister's response as well. Um, I, I very much look forward to, to speaking in this debate relating to cervical cancer screening. And I stand here today uh, to speak on behalf of my female constituents, uh, whom, for whom this directly affects. And I speak in support, complete support of the petition in the Just to Parliament, which had 146,000 signatures. Cancer is a tragedy that all of us know only too well. I'm sure it's touched the lives of everyone in this room today. And I know, I'm sure the Minister won't mind me saying it, but the Minister has been a, a, a direct recipient. And, and, and uh, we're very pleased to see her here as a survivor as well. I mean, we must take every necessary step of being able to catch diagnosis sooner rather than later. This petition for Fiona's law applies to women in England. However, I speak on behalf of my constituents and the women of Northern Ireland in relation to cervical cancer screening. Every year in the UK, I estimate that some 3,200 women will be diagnosed with cervical cancer. 80 people in Northern Ireland are diagnosed every annum, uh, every year. And figures state that roughly 20 to 30 of those 80 will sadly pass away from the disease. The Public Health uh, Agency in Northern Ireland has said that early detection and treatment can prevent seven to ten types of the can cervical cancers. In Northern Ireland, as a renewable gentleman for Bur uh, Berwickshire, Roxburgh, and Selkirk referred to, that Northern Ireland has a two year screening uh, programme. I would like to see it better. I'd be honest, I'd like to see it every year because I think that's the best way to do it. So the request from this debate is for early detection and treatment. Uh, on the way to prevent cervical cancer. It's important to remember that screening is not a test for cancer. It is a test to help prevent it, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. So hence why we must do more to ensure that women have screening appointments regularly to assist in preventing cervical cancers. Current legislation states that women between the age of 25 to 49 will be invited for screening once every three years, and those aged 50 to 64 every five years. This is aligned with the NHS long-term plan to detect 75% of cancers at stage one or two. Mr. Chairman, I cannot stress enough the importance of screening appointments for women. Firstly, I can only imagine it's not a comfortable, easy procedure to go through, but I do believe that the prolonged period of three years only increases anxiety more so. And firstly, uh, yearly screening would allow for a more effective diagnosis, but also gives, I believe, an opportunity to provide some familiarity and, comfort and comfortability, if it's possible, with a procedure that a lot of women dread attending. UK's leading cervical uh, cancer trust, Joe Church, released figures that are reported that 51% of women have been delaying a screening, 24% they delayed for a year and over a year, and 9%, uh, which, is, which, is, which is one in 10 women saying they had never attended a screening. These are shocking figures, but understandable, I believe, at the same time. These are lives being lost, and now it's getting worse due to the frequency of cervical screening. There needs to be more communication in regard to screening, so people are aware of what they're going into. This then provides a confidence and an increase in those attending, which ultimately results in the lives saved. More mothers, more daughters, more sisters, more grandmothers, and more wives. 
uh, living longer and healthier lives. Uh, I can say, uh, Mr. President, my wife went through it. Uh, it she did not for one second wish to go. Uh, found the whole thing very uncomfortable and, and perhaps maybe, honestly, a bit embarrassing. But, I mean, obviously we encouraged her. My mother encouraged her. Uh, I think that probably helped. Coming from a lady to a lady, I think it's probably better uh, uh, that, 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 that it was happening. So she went and got the test and got the all clear. In turn, cancers of all kinds have destroyed lives and families for too long. We must do all we can to increase early diagnosis, which is what this e-petition has been set up to do, especially with the impact of the pandemic, which has decreased screening figures even more. We need to get back on our feet and allow women yearly screening. I would urge the Minister uh, to undertake discussions with the NSC, the National Screening Committee, to ascertain why they feel women do not warrant being screened every year. And I end by saying that if you're invited for a cervical cancer screening, please go. And I can also say to the Government that the encouragement from the Minister will start here. More must be done to get more frequent appointments, more awareness of the benefits and more discussion around the appointment itself, as there is nothing more promising than the prevention of disease. Mr Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call Mike Kane, just a slight adjustment to the speakers list. I'll call um, Dr Philippa Whitford after Mr Kane uh, and then Alex uh, Norris. Mike Kane. Thank you, Mr Pritchard, and a pleasure to serve under your chairman. Uh, ship today and uh, can I add my congratulations to the petitioners for securing this debate in Parliament which is so so important. Now in January 2021 the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Prevention, Public Health and Primary Care stated that although we did not hold waiting lists for NHS screening programmes, NHS England were confident that no one eligible for cervical screening had been missed from receiving an invitation to screen. An invitation is one thing, being able to book and access a test can be quite a different matter. And in the third quarter of 2021, Mr Pritchard, no clinical commissioning groups in England achieved 80% coverage of women invited to test. I, of course, am aware of the pressures placed upon the NHS during the time of the pandemic. And my speech today is not to denigrate them at all. However, it is estimated that 600,000 cervical screening opportunities failed to go ahead in the UK in just April and May of last year. In October 2019, NHS England commissioned an independent review of adult screening programmes, which highlighted demographic factors, levels of affluence and deprivation, and ethnic diversity have a huge impact upon women taking up these tests. It is women living in areas with higher levels of deprivation, such as parts of my constituency of Withenshaw and Sale East, who have lower coverage than average at the, of these screening programmes. Also within my constituency, we have a fantastic company, Hologic, an innovative medical technology company whose primary focus is on improving women's health and well-being. They are specialists in high volume population screening. We know that over 99% of cervical cancer cases are preventable. And alongside HPV vaccination, cervical cancer screening is now one of the most effective ways to prevent this cancer. The point I wish to make today is that our opportunities to improve screening for both clinicians and for patients by adopting new innovative screening technologies. One such method is using HPV mRNA, Testing for primary cervical screening. These tests provide significantly higher clarity and would safely reduce the number of women who would require colposcopy, therefore reducing unnecessary fear, anxiety and stress for the women involved. It would also reduce pressure upon an already overburdened system and would save the NHS an estimated £15 million a year with potentially preventing 30,000 unnecessary procedures. Currently, just 54% of all samples in England are processed using this form of testing, meaning that 1.5 million women in England do not currently have access to this technology. England should move towards a system in which mRNA HPV primary screening is the gold standard and is used by all labs. Better coordination within, in, within NHS England would, for example, have cervical screening commissioned by the same part of the NHS as the colposcopies, enabling clinicians to work more effectively together and have a positive impact on patient experience and outcome. Another innovative technological advance is digital cytology. 
This advanced imaging technology used to identify lesions, precancerous cells, stores cervical images using cloud-based technology would help maximize screening capacity, enabling any cytologist with capacity in the network to access a particular image. This would provide much more flexible deployments of the workforce, would speed up time from the result to treatment if necessary, and provide physical efficiencies, less need for storage and for the transportation of cervical images and slides. Rolling out these technologies would save not only money and time, but would also in time reduce stress upon women and girls at a worrying time, as been, has been pointed out today as well as reduce the need for unnecessary gynecological procedures. It would also provide a streamlining, li streamlining of these life-saving services, and I would welcome any comments the Minister has uh, upon these suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr. Pritchard. It's an honour to serve under your chairmanship. Firstly, I would like to extend my sympathy to Fiona's family and friends who were moved by her loss to set up this petition in her name. I've seen firsthand the impact of cervical cancer as one of my friends lost her beautiful and vibrant daughter at the age of just 28 to this horrible disease. And as a breast cancer surgeon for over 30 years, I know the devastation caused by the death of any young woman. Before we go further, I just want to emphasize that any woman with symptoms of vaginal discharge or bleeding shouldn't wait for a screening appointment, but go and see your GP. There's usually a simple cause, but it's always important to get checked out. While the petition specifically calls for annual cervical smear tests, what we are all actually trying to achieve is the prevention and eventual elimination of cervical cancer as called for by the World Health Organization last August. For that, we have to understand the cause of cervical cancer, and that's where our knowledge has developed considerably. We know that 99.7% of cervical cancers are caused by high-risk strains of human papillomavirus, or HPV, and therefore that is the target of our efforts. This is through a true two-pronged strategy, providing protection to the younger generation through vaccination against HPV and using more sensitive PT PCR testing to detect HPV on cervical smear samples to identify those at increased risk. The HPV vaccine was introduced for young teenage girls in 2008 and initially included those up to 18 years so they would be vaccinated before leaving school. Research from the Scottish Cervical Screening Programme in 2017 reported a reduction in the presence of HPV in the smears of vaccinated women from 30% to 4.5%. And by 2019, demonstrated an 89% fall in grade three cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, the cell changes which can evolve into cervical cancer if left untreated. This dramatic reduction in CIN3 among the first cohort of vaccinated girls gives great hope that we'll see a fall in cervical cancer in this age group in the coming years. The vaccine is now also provided to boys, both to protect them from other HPV related cancers and to provide additional protection to women by reducing how many men are carrying HPV in the first place. It is vaccination against HPV that really offers the chance to eliminate this terrible disease by the end of the decade. But to achieve that, we need to vaccinate 90% of all teenagers and our uptake rates have drifted below this level over the last five years. Some of this is likely to be due to fears that the vaccine was associated with health issues, such as chronic fatigue or regional pain syndromes. However, a review by the European Medicines Agency found these conditions were very common among teenagers generally, and there was no increase among those who'd been vaccinated. To reduce the risk of cervical cancer, we need to get rid of the stigma of HPV and ensure all women and young people understand its importance in the development of cancer. It's a very common virus, which in the vast majority of cases causes no harm and is cleared by the body's own defenses. 
but some strains pose a higher risk of causing malignant change. After vaccination, the other critical approach to preventing cervical cancer is of course screening itself. But here too, the focus is now on detecting HPV as the driver of cervical changes that can eventually lead to cancer. Classical cytology, which looks for abnormal cells within cervical smears, doesn't pick up every case. While PCR, which we've heard so much about during the pandemic, is more sensitive in detecting HPV and identifying the women who are at higher risk. The UK National Screening Committee has therefore recommended changing to a two-step testing procedure with the cervical sample tested for HPV first and then cytology performed on those samples which contain virus. Currently, this is carried out on one sample, which is co collected in the traditional way by a clinician having to visualize the cervix directly. If the sample contains HPV, cytology is carried out on the cervical cells. And if any changes are found, the patient is referred to a gynecologist for colposcopy, where the cervix is examined and biopsied to assess the grade of cell changes. If a woman is HPV positive but has no cell changes and therefore would never have been highlighted from the old system, she will undergo repeat screening the following year. And if the virus persists after two years, even without cell changes, will be referred for colposcopy. Therefore, by focusing on the presence of the virus, women carrying HPV and at higher risk are provided with more intensive follow-up. And it is the UK screening committee which has re recommended that women who are HPV negative and therefore at very low risk are offered routine repeat screening every five years from the age of 25 to 65. This system has been fully rolled out in Scotland since March of last year, but I would highlight the same approach is planned across all four UK nations once the PCR testing and data systems are in place. Screening remains vital in detecting cervical cancer and its precursors in women who didn't have the opportunity to be vaccinated against HPV. But uptake is at a 20 year low with just over 70% of women attending overall. Attendance is even lower among younger women and those from minority ethnic groups or more deprived communities, as well as among lesbian or transgender people who may mistakenly think they are less at risk of HPV infections. The challenge is therefore how to engage more women to take part in cervical screening and changing to annual cervical examination might actually cause more women to withdraw from the program. With HPV being found in only about 10% of cervical smear tests, carrying out a simple vaginal swab to test for HPV could reduce the number of women who have to undergo a formal cervical smear with direct visualization of the cervix. This would therefore avoid the need to use a speculum and reduce the discomfort which puts some women off taking up future appointments. It would also greatly reduce the difficulties experienced by those with physical or learning disabilities. Indeed, disabled women have been campaigning for years about the fact that those with the greatest physical difficulties often struggle to take part in screening at all. A team in Dumfries and Galloway Health Board in Scotland established a trial in 2012 in which over 5,000 women took vaginal swabs themselves as well as getting a formal cervical smear done in the traditional way. This demonstrated both the accuracy and acceptability of this approach and they're working with the Scottish Government to consider making this part of our routine screening programme. However, the UK National Screening Committee is still evaluating this approach, but research by Joe's Trust suggests this simpler method of sampling could get more women to engage, take up HB, HBV testing as the first step of screening. This is particularly important among groups which currently have a much higher risk of cancer but a lower engagement with the screening program. NHS England has now begun a trial of offering self-administered HPV swabs to 31,000 women in parts of London who have failed to attend their routine appointments. My one gripe with this excellent project was that the publicity and social media around its launch 
described them as self-administered smear tests, instead of explaining they were simple vaginal swabs, which a woman should easily be able to carry out at home. This caused a lot of consternation among women who wondered how on earth they were meant to ensure that they visualized or took a sample from their own cervix. And it could put some off trying to take the sample in the first place. And describing them as smear tests could also lead someone who's HPV positive to fail to attend their GP for formal assessment if they're under the mistaken impression they've already had a cervical smear. The NHS project in London is designed to engage those who've not taken up the routine invitations, but I hope that simple vaginal swabs to test for HPV will eventually become a routine step available to all women, whether self-administered in the privacy of their own home or by a clinician in their local GP practice. HPV vaccination holds the potential to drastically reduce the number of young women who are even at risk of cervical cancer. But screening will always be important to detect cell changes or early cancer. And all of us need to encourage high uptake of both vaccination and screening. While I recognize the anguish of Fiona's family that led them to start this petition, I hope they can see that our understanding of this terrible disease and its cause opens up new and better approaches to eliminating cervical cancer in this coming decade, so other families don't suffer the loss they're going through. Well, we stay virtual now, the Shadow Minister, Alex Norris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pritchard, and it's a pleasure to serve uh, under your chairship today, and I wouldn't normally make uh, the, the front bench contribution for the opposition virtually, but I'm afraid that I've also been pinged by the app, so I'm beaming in live from, from Nottingham this afternoon. And I thank to my, my fellow pingee, the Honourable Member for Gower, for bringing this debate forward through her role in the Petitions Committee. And I think the points that she made about testing have been a common thread that have read throughout this debate, but also the points around the impact of COVID, which is something I, I'm going to reflect on myself shortly. Now, the petition in question has received close to 150,000 signatures, which is frankly an incredible effort, as well as showing the strength of feeling on this important topic. It's also a very physical demonstration of the legacy and the impact of a young mother, Fiona Matthewson, who tragically lost her life to cervical cancer last April at the age of 30. And I'd like to send my best wishes to the Matthewson family, to, to Andrew, to Harry, to Ivy. Um, I lost my father when I was Harry's age. I lost my father to cancer. I know that impact, the, the impact that has on on you and on your family, but I hope that the family can take comfort from the incredible campaign that they've run and the, and the way they've been able to turn such awful grief into positive action. And it's because of them that we're here today and because of Fiona that we're here today. And I hope they've seen the, across the debate that, you know, we've had all, all four countries of the UK represented um, with, you know, I think very thoughtful and very impressive contributions. Started, of course, by uh, by your own Member of Parliament, the Honourable Member for Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk. And I think the points that he made about those uh, twin giants of, around prevention of screening and, and HPV uh, in, uh, jabs have, have been something that, again, has come through through the debate and I'll reflect on myself. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for Pontypreeth, was gener very generous with her own personal experiences and we're glad that it's had the ending that it's had. And But I think there will be people who are watching the debate today that it will make them think perhaps of maybe about a screening they've missed, whether it's relating to their cervical health or, or otherwise. And I think that's a really important lesson that the people have taken from her. And I know that she inspires people in that way. I think too, there were important points made by the, the honorable member for, for Rutherglen and Hamilton West around health equity, particularly in the, the, the lesbian and bisexual community, um, but also around those who've been, who are suffering from sexual violence. We really must make sure that we tailor our messages and the way in which we contact people to understand their different circumstances and to, to know that they may present in different ways or need different support. And, and we would always want that support to be available to them. Uh, my honourable friend, the, the member for, for Coventry Northwest, uh, brings, as always, her experience as a, as a senior oncology pharmacist to this debate. And she knows very much about the impact of cancer on, on people's lives and how to design cancer services. So I thought particularly the point she made about the mental impact of COVID, because generally when we talk about COVID in the cancer space, we talk about missed screenings or the backlog or late presentation. But the, the point she made about the mental impact, and you know, it's hard, of course, for me to relate to what it's like to be called uh, for, for a smear test. 
but the point that she made around you know hurdles getting in the way and this being a very big hurdle that makes people perhaps just set it to one side I think was was very well made and linked with what the honourable member for Strangford said around the importance of effective co communication and then finally the the, the member for the my honourable friend the member for Willingshaw and say at least I think you know, again, and this is something we've seen very clearly over the last 16, 17 months, the importance of brilliant British science. And, you know, we need to back our brilliant British science and our, our brilliant companies uh, in order to get the best possible outcomes for ourselves here in Britain, uh, but also around the world too. And now just to make a few points uh, of my own, Mr Pritchard, uh, as we've heard every year in the UK, around 3,200 people get cervical cancer and cancer research estimates that uh, in, that in 2018, 857 of those died of, from that disease. Uh, while incidence rates have not fallen significantly in the last two decades, the good news is that mortality rates have continued to fall, especially amongst older patients. And since the beginning of the 70s, the mortality rate has dropped from 10 women per 100,000 to approximately two and a half. This is significant pro progress, which has saved the lives uh, of, of many. And as we've heard, Screening through the NHS cervical screening programme is a huge part of this, with the NHS estimating that it saves 5,000 lives a year, which is a truly wonderful thing. In 2019, HPV primary screening was added to the programme, replacing cytology, as the member, member for Central Asia said, uh, a major step which the, NH, which, NH, which the NHS believe has the potential uh, to eliminate cervical cancer by spotting earlier those 14 types in the HPV infection, which combine to be the main cause of cervical cancer. An earlier diagnosis, as we know, makes such a difference and quite simply saves lives. Whether cancer is diagnosed at stage one or two, uh, one year survival is over 90%, which drops to 75% at stage three and 50% at stage four. And data from the National Cancer Intelligence Network also shows that the cervical cancer three year relative survival rate is higher amongst people diagnosed via screening than any other route. So if there's a message to come today, it is, of course, the importance of that screening. But also, we know there's scope to improve in this area. Exciting new advancements using uh, mRNA, gene therapy, artificial intelligence, combination therapies, robotics, and many more, such as the Honourable Member for Women's Insurance, Ellie said, will transform our care in cancer. So as we restore services affected by the pandemic, we shouldn't be looking to restore what we had 18 months ago, but to embrace new developments and to help us that way build new pathways of care. Um, on screening frequency, which of course is what this petition relates to, uh, cervical screening is in, in England is offered to the cohort aged 25 to 64. Uh, while routine screening is now offered every three years up to 49 years of age and every five years between 50 and 64, the UK National Screening Committee has recommended that for those who test negative uh, for high-risk HPV, the interval can be extended to five years for those individuals. And I, I understand that this is to be implemented once necessary IT developments allow it. And I, I hope the minister in her closing could confirm when this is likely to be. And I fully sympathise with and appreciate the arguments for more screenings as has been made in the petition. And any lives, of course, we can save really strengthen the case more stronger than anything I can sit here and say. But I strongly believe it is right that, that this is a decision made by the experts on the screening committee and not by us as politicians. Um, so where, where the clinical evidence supports their decisions to do the screening intervals at the stages they say and, and not to extend also testing to age 18, as I know there's been calls for, then, then we support that. But beyond that, we must do more, the government must do more to increase take up and ensure all those who are eligible for a cervical smear test attend their, uh, their appointments when they're invited or as soon after as possible. Um, they must also ensure that preventive measures such as the vaccination do get out into secondary schools and are taken up fully. And again, I'd be interested to hear in the Minister's reflections of, about what further plans there are to develop this, because we know we're not getting quite where we want to. Uh, the aim is for 80% of women to access their tests, with 75% being considered acceptable. Well, the final year prior to the pandemic, this was just over 72%, a, a little bit up from 71.9% the year before. So that's not where we want it to be. We must do something diff uh, different. And of course, as, as my honourable friend, the member for Gower said, the pandemic has worsened this. Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust estimates that around 600,000 cervical screenings failed to go ahead in the UK in April and May 2020. And the NHS's own data shows that no CCG screened over 80% of eligible women adequately uh, in the third quarter of 2021. 
these numbers are people who could who could be living either with high risk HPV or with cancer itself and do not know this yet. So I hope the minister will expand on the data to prevent uh, to paint a full picture of the situation as she sees it, but also to share as the steps as to how these services are going to be uh, caught up and we're going to re reach those who have so, uh, so far missed out. Uh, so to conclude, uh, Mr Pritchard, those who've raised this petition deserve real commendation for their excellent efforts. I'm sorry that perhaps the evidence isn't pushing us in the direction that they've encouraged us, but I do hope as perhaps when Harry and Ivy are teenagers that they may look back on this debate and they will watch us. They might wonder why we're all beaming in from different parts in our own bedrooms or or whether at, at home, but that when they look at it, they see th that this was a real galvanizing moment for politicians coming together across the Great Britain and Northern Ireland to improve screening rates, to improve the, the uptake of the HPV vaccine. And that as we went forward, we embraced improvements in technology and in, in, in cancer care. And that as a result, we got more and more brilliant outcomes uh, for women in this country. And I hope, as I say, when they look back at this in many years time, they're very proud of theirs, their families and their friends role in doing that. Thank you, Chair. Minister. Thank you very much indeed. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Mr. Pritchard. I would firstly like, as I think everybody has, to um, thank those who started this petition in Fiona Matheson's memory and join others in extending my sympathy to Andrew, to Ivy, to Harry, to Caitlin, um, and to the broader family, and to the 3,000 um, individuals in Kelso, uh, Kelso and across um, the borders who signed the petition. And I know, as other honourable members, the honourable member for Pontypridd, for example, I know how frightening it is to be given that diagnosis and I can only imagine the impact and the loss that Andrew feels. But if I can say one thing, this conversation today is in itself a huge legacy um, for Fiona because we are discussing sensibly what we need to do to help women. We are talking, as many people have said, about something that is often seen as just a little bit embarrassing and to the points of honourable members that we must improve take up. I couldn't agree more, but you don't do that by not talking about some of the challenges that are out there. Cancer screening is crucial and I would like to thank each and every member who have shown their support and contributed to today's to debate um, so eloquently introduced by the Honourable Member for Gower um, on putting it forward for the Petitions Committee in allowing us to have that conversation across the United Kingdom because it has been. And because the simple fact is that screening saves lives and that is why we need to drive that uptake because as we've heard it can prevent cancer from developing it can catch cancer early as we know the earlier people are diagnosed then the better the outcomes and so there is a greater chance that treatment can be successful and thanks to the tremendous work of dedicated screening staff up and down the country the nhs cervical screening program reaches about 4.6 million women in england every year and currently saves about 5,000 lives. However, we've heard repeatedly that only about 70% of women actually take their opportunity up for a plethora of reasons. But if everybody did attend, that number would be closer to 7,000. It would be more of those lives saved. So when you receive an appointment, an, an invitation to attend a screening appointment, please go. And as the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire said, if you notice anything amiss and it, there's bleeding after sexual intercourse, between periods or during your menopause, discuss this with 
a medical professional, don't wait. It's your body and just treasure it because a screening tool is, uh, screening is one tool, but that knowledge of yourself is also another tool that you have in order to access treatment quickly. And NHS services are open, safe and ready to help you. And that is another thing that's come through. I want to reinforce that NH the NHS is open and the services are safe. And you must come forward when you receive your invitation for an appointment. Well, yes, of course. Absolutely. I'm grateful for the Minister for giving way on that point. Uh, the member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West talked about some of the challenges faced by the lesbian and bisexual community in accessing appointments. But I think we also need to recognise some of the challenges faced by um, our trans community, especially trans men, in accessing appointments, many of whom do not get sent reminder letters because of administrative policies at GP services. So will the Minister look into that to ensure that everyone with a cervix um, was eligible to attend a screening does receive a reminder. Minister. Uh, indeed I will and I'd be happy to write to her afterwards because it is something that I've looked at. It is important that if there's a chance you, you may have abnormal cells then you should get them checked out. So, and that goes the Honourable Member for um, Coventry, I'm going to North West, um, also, uh, also spoke about making sure that we reach those communities who wouldn't necessarily come forward for a, a measure of reasons. And there was also the um, honourable member for with and Sale East, who, although he spoke, as several did, about using technology better, he also spoke about the challenges of screening um, and the health inequality that there is in certain communities accessing screening, which is something that I've met with NHS England on several times, thinking how, how we can use both that technology, but also um, how we can use um, different avenues. So I will come on and speak in a minute about the self-sampling sample, but um, we have to think uh, differently about how we encourage women because not every woman, not every wom woman, will come forward in the same way, and and we have different pressures on our lives at different times, and maybe we are not as good at the younger end because their people think, as the honourable member for Pontypridd said so eloquently, don't didn't think it would happen to me, right? But also, you have a young family, perhaps, or you're busy at work. All these things mean that we have to make it as easy as we possibly can to access screening wherever you are and in whatever form suits you because there are also cultural barriers for some accessing not only cervical screening but also breast screening um, where they are hesitant for, to come forward. So in all those areas, I've, yes of course. Question I referred to and I give the example of my wife um, who had some difficulty um, maybe um, making the appointment, but uh, what she did do was talk to my mum, uh, and I, I do feel that woman talking to woman is much easier, and we shouldn't always um, push to the back of the queue, for instance, uh, a family member having a discussion, sometimes it starts with a discussion, after the discussion then it goes to the hospital, but it's very important we do that, I think those family members that are around can support and give advice as well, thank you. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Or even, as we heard earlier, a good group of friends perhaps giving you that nudge when you're feeling a little bit hesitant. As people have said, it's not the greatest outing to go on of an afternoon, but it can be one of the most important appointments that you may keep. So I would urge you to keep it. I want to assure all women that screening staff are excellently trained to ensure that you feel reassured, you feel comfortable. And for those who feel anxious, um, there is information available online to help uh, you plan your appointment. And as many have done, I would like to um, just mention the work and commend the work of Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust in raising awareness about cervical, um, what cervical screening entails and how important it is. Now, I'll turn now to the nub of today's debate, which is why screening isn't offered on a yearly basis. Now, currently, cervical screening in England is offered to individuals between 25 and 49 every three, three years and between 50 and 64 every five years. 
and for those aged 65 and over, screening is offered if one of their last three results detected any abnormalities. Now, while health, including how screening is delivered, is a devolved matter, as we've said, what today's debate has shown is that actually, wherever we are in the country, we do share the need to uh, ensure that health is a priority. We actually transfer data um, to the devolved authorities automatically to Northern Ireland and, and Wales on um, a woman's history because I think it was the Honourable Member for Gower who brought up how we worked with devolved authorities. So that information goes automatically um, for uh, Wales and Northern Ireland but actually it's still a manual process uh, with Scotland and that is work in progress to make sure we get there. Now, um, as I said, it's devolved, but, but as others have said, we all follow the expert advice of the UK National Screening Committee, UKNSC, and um, the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire pointed out how important that is, that we follow um, that advice of a body at the centre. And in 2015, UK uh, NSC recommended that a test for uh, HPV was used as the primary screen. And we've heard that from many people. And we heard it's because it's 99.7% um, uh, of cervical cancers are caused by the high risk HPV types. Now, I couldn't agree more, and I apologise, I don't remember which honourable member it was, um, that we should talk about HPV in a very normal way, non-stigmatising, have a conversation. It's important that we talk about those things that affect our body and enable people just to seek treatment and do something about it. If HPV is detected, you're referred for further testing. Cells are tested for abnormalities, and if present, you're tested again to see if treatment is necessary. If not, a follow-up appointment is always made for the following year, um, and if it's n not detected, no action is required because it's highly unlikely that any abnormal cells are present and the chance of developing a cancer within five years is very small. This process has been in place since December 2019 um, and in Scotland since March 2020 and it's made cervical screening more effective, improved detection rates and crucially requires women to be screened less frequently because there is a very salient point that the more often you introduce something, there is, um, there is a risk that it is not taken up. So actually making sure that we have the best tests at the best time interval, advised by the experts, is how we will, how we will proceed. Um, but that is not to say that all those technologies um, but so aptly described by the Honourable Member for Withenshaw and Sale, but others are available, um, are not being looked at the whole time in all these areas because if, 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 there is a, if there is a positive from the pandemic, it is that we have moved forward in so many areas of technology and we need, as several members have said, to harness that. Now, given the strong link between HPV and cervical cancer, the National HPV Immunisation Programme is a key way to save lives. Now, introduced in 2008 and extended to boys in 2019, the vaccines already, as we've heard, led to dramatic reductions in HPV infections in England. And it's hoped that immunisation will eventually eradicate HPV and save hundreds more lives each year. And to the comment, as uh, this has been a challenging year, uh, last year, but as soon as um, as soon as the pandemic hit, we charged those in charge of the scheme it, to make sure that they had caught up by this August with um, the HPV vaccinations in schools. They've used schools, community centres, and so on, just to make sure that we don't fall behind on what is such an essential part of the program, because we know that it actually gives that protection. I do, however, acknowledge that screening isn't perfect. HPV infection or abnormal cells can be missed and they can develop and turn into cancer between um, screening tests. It is incredibly rare and the science supports the, 
the hope, and I have that hope, that with the introduction of HPV testing, vaccination, many more cancers can be um, detected um, and prevented. As a number of uh, honourable members have mentioned, self-sampling, um, and I think it was the honourable member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West spoke um, of self-sampling, as did others. Um, I am incredibly interested in this proposal. The Uscreen trial, currently taking place in London, is sending home testing kits to some of those who haven't offered up who haven't taken up the offer of screening and actually making sure you are offering women who might find other um, environments difficult to be part of um, because of time or a whole range of reasons. They may prefer to do a simple swab test in their own home. Um, that is what this is uh, designed to do and is particularly targeted at disadvantaged groups who may not have attended um, because as I say there are busy lives there is embarrassment and there is cultural barriers so making sure we push that forward is important so there are plans for a nationwide trial to offer self sample kits to women as an alternative to a nurse taking the sample um, and I've asked my officials to keep me informed of the trials and I eagerly await the UK NSC's um, analysis once it's complete and the subsequent recommendations about how self-sampling may be incorporated into the cervical screening programme. Now, um, the, I think we all agreed that um, the need is for women to come forward and I would like to thank the tone of the debate today and how everybody expressed their concern um, for us making sure that we uh, get to those women and I would like to reassure people that uh, we did indeed um, cancel those invitations early on in the pandemic but there is currently no national backlog of people waiting for an invitation to the NHS cervical screening program um, and we have been working with um, providers and supporting with them to work above pre-pandemic levels to manage diagnostic backlogs. Now waiting times for some appointments have increased in some areas and in those areas specifically working with Public Health England, Screening Quality Assurance Services and the relevant CCGs because the problem um, isn't everywhere but I am, I am aware that there is a problem in certain parts of the country. So I would like to thank everyone for their contribution today. I would like to express my sympathy, and I know I speak for each and every member here, to Fiona's family and friends. The most effective way to prevent deaths from cervical cancer is for as many women as possible to attend their routine appointments, as opposed to moving to that yearly screening. Cervical screening undoubtedly saves lives, so once again, when you receive the invitation, please go. And if you notice any worrying symptoms in the meantime, contact your GP. NHS services are open, safe and ready to help you. And to help you keep safe, you have to help us by attending. So we can drive that rate up, up into the sort of levels that mean we can prevent um, each and every woman from having what is, in effect, a preventable cancer if we can make sure that the screening programme reaches as many as possible. Tonya Antoniazzi to wind up. Thank you, Chair, and I thank the Minister for her response. Um, I'd also like to thank the Honourable Member for Berwickshire, Oxburn and Selkirk for his contribution. As Andrew Matheson's MP, he made a very heartfelt contribution on behalf of Fiona's family and all her friends. And in the really powerful and very personal speech from my great friend, the Honourable Member for Pontypridd, we heard about the very serious risks that missing your screening can pose. Her story is a stark reminder of the importance of keeping your appointments and getting regularly tested. 
The Honourable Member for the Glen and Hamilton West touched on many of the groups that are less likely to attend their appointments and the government have a duty of care to improve messaging to those in harder to reach communities. Uh, in fact, uh, my honourable friend from pont de in her intervention to the Minister, uh, highlighted um, that there is an issue around non-binary and trans men not to miss their appointment for cervical screening, which highlights the importance of recording biological sex on medical records to ensure that this doesn't happen. And the Honourable Member for Strangford was very clear in the, his message that screening is not a test for cancer. It is a test to prevent cancer, and I think this is a really important message to get across to all women. And my honourable friend, the member for Worthingshaw and Sale East, highlighted the fact that not one trust in England achieved 80% coverage of the tests. He highlighted the work of Hologic, a cutting edge company in his constituency, which specialises in the high volume population screening, a resource that we need to take full advantage of when beating cancer. And I'd like to echo the calls for the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire. If you have vaginal discharge or bleeding, go and see your, uh, your GP, not your MP, and don't wait for an invitation. The HPV vaccine, 30% to 4.5%. The Honourable Lady also mentioned the difficulties that physically disabled people have in attending their cervical smears, which is why when the Minister spoke about the... Um, when she spoke about the self-sampling project that's going to be rolled out nationwide, that is really going to be key to getting as many women tested for cervical screening as possible. But my honourable friend, the member for Nottingham North, drew on his vast knowledge of health issues and made a powerful case for building back our screening capabilities better and using all of these technological advances that are available to us and that have been spoken about today. But I'd just like to conclude by thanking the Minister for her comments and for the ability for us across parties, across all devolved countries in the UK, being able to discuss the issue sensibly. The, the bottom line is we must improve take-up and we must talk about it because screening saves lives. Thank you, Chair. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 317336 relating to survival screening. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting is suspended until 6.15. Uh, could colleagues please leave the room via the exit uh, marked and observe social distancing? And thank you again to our excellent technical teams. Thank you.